Ladies and gentlemen, this is Aaron A. Train Smith, and I'm sitting here with my good friend John J. Thompson, the only real one, and you're listening to the True Tunes Podcast. Hello, I'm John J. Thompson, and welcome back to the True Tunes Podcast. This is going to be a really special and kind of bittersweet episode for us here because we are going to finally revisit a conversation I recorded 25 years ago with Rich Mullins. Rich was one of the most influential and inspirational artists in the history of this thing called Christian music, but he was also an enormous influence on me personally. Rich died in a car accident in 1997, just a couple of years after I recorded this interview. It was a devastating loss for many of us personally, and for his fans, he was truly one of a kind. My life does not play out like my albums do. When you put out an album, you're assuming that people are going to listen to it, and you want to say things that are relevant to your listeners. So music that I write that is, is intensely personal and really is kind of my own business kind of music, there's some of it that I just kind of go, boy, nobody would really, this is not anybody's business. This is my own personal therapy. There's no reason to burden listeners with that. So people hear those albums and, and they think that that's the sum total of who I am and what I'm about. I kind of go, wow, you know, these albums don't address some of the real central issues of my life. So I think people have the illusion when, you, when you're a, a, a musician. They have the illusion that they know you real intimately and real well. And, and the truth is, you know what I have chosen for you to know. <laughs> And I've shown you my absolute best side. I believe in God the Father, Almighty Maker of Heaven and Maker of Earth. And yes, like our recently rediscovered Larry Norman interview, this tape also went missing for over two decades. The truth is, this interview was done kind of on the fly. Rich had been dropping by the original True Tune store quite a bit back then. He was staging a musical he had written called Canical of the Plains at Wheaton College just a few blocks away. Sometime before the release of his 1995 album, Brothers Keeper, he played me a couple of songs from it. Then one day we were hanging out at True Tunes just talking about all kinds of things when he said, hey, you should record this and make it an interview for your magazine. I didn't have a blank tape handy, so I took a pre-release tape from a big box. It just happened to be from the metal band White Cross. I, I just put some scotch tape over the little safety notches on the top and taped over it. No offense, guys. And uh, I never imagined in my wildest dreams that anybody but me was ever going to hear this. I just needed to be able to hear it clearly enough to transcribe the words for the print magazine. So, well, let's just say that the conversation you are going to hear is both technologically challenged and incredibly relaxed. Relaxed. I was also exactly half as old as I am now, and I sound like a child. But what I do love about it is that you can hear a bit of that big brother relationship Rich had with me. I'll tell you a bit more about that later. Any good artist is going to have something that is really human in their work. And I know I'm hung up about being an artist because I'm kind of going, gee, it's hard to think of yourself as an artist when your stuff is being sold in Christian bookstores. I think some precious moments. Yeah. And <laughs> so, I mean, I, I'm not, but I, I kind of go, there was a time when I was pretentious enough to go, well, my art is blah, 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 or, you know, I'm trying to do this or I'm trying to do that, and hung out with people who were into all that. And, you know, now I look back on it and I think, wow, what a bunch of pretentious little snobs we all were. <laughs> And seeing that this is such a special occasion, I wanted to expand on the conversation a bit. Rich was doggedly determined to make his music about something much bigger than himself. He created a sort of traveling community, be it just he and one other person for smaller shows or his full-blown ragamuffin band. So before we get to my vintage conversation with the man himself, we're going to hear from several of his comrades. I gathered the surviving ragamuffins, Jimmy Abeg, Mark Robertson, and Aaron Smith for their first first group interview since the passing of their fellow member and another close friend and mentor of mine, Rick Elias. I also tracked down Mitch McVicker, the musical compadre that was actually with Rich in the car accident that took his life. 
I also talked with Phil Madeira a bit about his memories of working with Rich. And last but not least, we have some new music and comments from singer-songwriter Derek Webb, who, along with his old band Cademan's Call, was hugely influenced by Rich, both creatively and personally, and, though he has moved away from Christian music and Christianity in general, just released a stirring acoustic cover of Rich's song, We Are Not As Strong As We Think We Are. I took the hand of God Almighty To part the waters of the sea But it only took one little light Separate you and me Oh, we are not as strong As we think we are My hope is that through this tapestry of reflections, we might find a more three-dimensional portrait of the man, his heart, and his music. Is it possible that Rich left some kind of codes or maps behind for us, spiritual and musical reference points that, if we listen closely enough, might speak to some of the challenges we face today? With all of this great stuff, we've definitely decided to break this into two episodes. On this first half, we'll hear the interview with the Ragamuffins. On part two, we'll hear from Mitch McVicker, Phil Madeira, Derek Webb, and through a bunch of magnetic particles laid over some sweet hair metal licks on an aging cassette that we have done our best to restore, we'll hear from Rich himself. We'll also crank up the jukebox on part two and check out an artist that seems to have carried Rich's creative spirit into the new millennium, Mr. Andrew Peterson. Father Abraham, do you remember when you were called to a land and you didn't know the way? Cause we are wandering in a foreign land. We are children of the promise of the faith. And I long to find it Can you feel it too That the sun that's shining Is a shadow of the truth This is a far country It's just a far Rich meant a lot to me because, as I look back now, I realize that he was a very early example, a role model as it were, of an artist, a seeker, and a believer who wasn't afraid to admit when he didn't have the answers, but also wasn't afraid to speak up when he had something to say. And when I call him a seeker, I mean it. He seemed to see the faith journey more as a way, a path to walk, than as a set of propositions to accept or reject. He was always reading interesting books and then telling his friends about them. He modeled a kind of curiosity and teachability that I have tried to emulate throughout my life. So we're going to take our time here and really listen to Rich, to his songs, and to his friends, because it seems that the world needs listeners and learners more than ever right now. Before we dive in, I have a few things to insert right here. First, I want to thank our sponsors at visiontrust.org. Vision Trust works alongside local heroes in some of the most vulnerable places in the world. And for just over a dollar a day, you can absolutely change the world for one boy or one girl by allowing one of these champions to provide that child with food, education, love, spiritual support, and frankly, hope. Find the link on the show notes page for this episode at truetunes.com and join me as a sponsor through Vision Trust. There's a lot more on the show notes page as well, including a full list of all of the songs you'll hear on this episode, a whole list of pertinent links, information about the novel I am currently working on and could really use your help finishing and releasing, and more. So please take a minute to check that page out. It's also enormously helpful to us if you subscribe to our email list, like our page at True Tunes Now on Facebook, and leave us a five-star review at Apple Podcasts and tell your friends about the show. You are the best resource we have for getting the word out about this show. You are our network. Your endorsements are so appreciated. Thank you very much. Okay. 
let's jump into my conversation with the Ragamuffin band members, each of whom I must confess are very important people in my life. So don't expect anything like journalistic neutrality here. Some of you know bassist Mark Robertson for his work with the Altar Boys. Others may know his fantastic rockabilly band, This Train. And I'll say I was thrilled to help release their first album on my little indie label back in the 90s. Mark was also a regular writer for True Tunes back in the print magazine days. He is currently one of the most respected bass players in Nashville, having served long stints with both the Shack Shakers and the Eskimo Brothers. Aaron Smith, who of course was the drummer for the 77s from about 1984 to 92 or so, also played with a little Detroit group called The Temptations, the new wave group Romeo Void, and many others. He is one of my all-time favorite drummers, and Jimmy Abeg, or Jimmy A. The guitarist, bassist, painter, poet, photographer has been a friend and inspiration for just about as long as I can remember. Jimmy and Aaron live just blocks from me here in East Nashville. Mark did as well until recently when he moved a couple towns north. But due to COVID concerns, we did this interview half in person and half remote. I was with Jimmy in his brand new art studio, safely distanced of course, and we got Mark and Aaron to join online. Aaron had some connection problems, so I got him in a separate chat a bit later to ask him a few follow-up questions. So come with me now into what is aptly and affectionately called Blind Jimmy's Lighthouse, and join me and the Ragamuffin Band as we take a trip back to the 90s to contemplate the legacy of their chief Ragamuffin. How did you end up crossing paths and getting involved with Rich? What's interesting to me is that most of his success was right down the middle of Christian music. His songs were on Christian radio, his songs were in churches, like it was it was Christian music. And yeah. you guys, the ragamuffins, were definitely all from the fringes, if that, um, of that scene. So how did you end up coming into his orbit and becoming such a big part of what he did? How did that happen? Rich always struggled with the concept of thinking he wasn't that cool. So he wanted like, I think he, he gravitated toward Jimmy and Rick because they're, they're super cool and they think differently than all the people when he tried, when Rich tried to live in Nashville, you know, he just, he, he was miserable. Because he was hanging out in, you know, Cool Springs and with people who he just couldn't quite relate to, even though that was the world he was in. Rich could write big hit Christian songs. But I, I think he wanted to be a little more, you know, I think obviously he wanted to take it a little deeper than that, if he could. So I, I think that's why he grabbed Jimmy and Rick, because because they were kind of like the cool guys who were well-rounded players, you know, and that's, that's my theory. And if Jimmy can correct me if I'm wrong, but my memory of it is when Rich wanted to put together a full-time band and call it the Ragamuffin Band and all that stuff, he said, you know, Rick, you, you find one guy and Jimmy, you, you find a guy. That, that was kind of my take on it. And Jimmy picked uh, Aaron and Rick picked me. Yeah. I'll just add a little bit of info into that equation because what had happened is we had all successfully completed a liturgy, a legacy, and a ragamuffin band record. And Rich thought certainly we had to have a ragamuffin band. Well, Billy Crockett, one of the guitar players, was not interested. He had his own career going. Chris McHugh, the drummer on that record, uh, was in heavily into production and you know his own thing going. So he declined the offer. Um, Danny O'Lanerty, who played bass on that record, also declined because he had a pretty busy session life in Nashville going. And if if you're if you're not aware, if you're a session guy and you take a tour for six or eight weeks you might not get hired when you get home because they think you're gone and then you know rich and reed and at the time lee lundgren shared uh some of the keyboard duties and we came up short there too so prior to uh prior to assembling to do the what became the Brothers Keeper record, we ended up pulling in Phil Madeira to cover some territory that Lee was not uh, capable of or, or didn't want to do or whatever. I don't really remember. But you're right, Mark. When, when asked, 
who could be a great drummer. I had been playing with Aaron for years, and I thought, well, man, Aaron Smith. And, of course, the same question floated to Rick was, well, heck, Mark Robertson, it doesn't get any better. So suddenly we had this core, um, and I'll leave Phil out of it because he had a, a little bit of a different uh, – his was his invitation was more of a can you do these next three weeks whereas with you and Aaron it was more like would you be willing to join this band I mean I think it's funny because the ragamuffins you know Ben Pearson an ancillary figure to all of this on the sidelines has a very funny thing to say um, since we're all fringe like John said uh, you know, Rick and I, especially kind of way out on the fringes of what would be considered, you know, commercially uh, successful Christian music. I mean, Rick was certainly more successful than I ever was. And he's uh, uh, he, he is missed to this day because his voice was loud and clear, all his own. And it was it was a trip that Rick made with Rich to, I believe, Guatemala that really sort of iced their friendship uh, fundamentally. And then, of course, the Legacy record. And the same with me. I mean, I met Rich. Um, I was playing with Peacock, and we had done a showcase for industry folks at uh, what was then a performance studio, which no longer exists, over in the uh, Sylvan Park area. I can't even remember the name of it to tell you the truth, but we had a full blown secret of time record on our hands. And, uh, we were, uh, doing a showcase. And as soon as we got done doing the set, you know, to a packed house of Christian music Illuminati, I walk outside to have my, uh, necessary smoky treat. Thank you, Mark Robertson for coining that phrase. And I'm out by the dumpster having a cigarette, and this this street, I, I thought it was a homeless guy, comes up to me and says, hey, you got another one? And I said, of course. I'd never turn down an, an, an ask for a smoky treat. So I gave him a cigarette, and we stood there for probably 40 minutes. And uh, it wasn't about the music. I mean, he, we didn't talk about what we had just been through once. I mean, it was an amazing... <laughs> You know, usually people are like, oh, man, that was so great. I loved what blah, 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 blah. And with Rich, it was like, so what are you up to? And, you know, I'll, I'll never forget that conversation because we really kind of landed someplace friendly within a couple of weeks. I got an invitation to go do a few weeks with him. And at the time, a ad hoc collection of mostly teenagers from Wichita uh, to do my first 45 city run with him. And I think I have to say the two things, there might be three things that he liked about me. Um, one, I had discussed at length my Catholic roots and I was still, you know, secretly being a Catholic in this fundamentalist evangelical world. And I think that was, that was something he thought was interesting because little did I know he was on his own reckless pursuit of you know something other than what was being offered in the uh, evangelical movement so that coupled with my ability to swear like a sailor and receive his swearing with equal uh, admiration and then on top of that I'm a smoke I'm a smoker you know we're, we're smoking Back in those days, I smoked a lot more than I, I ever did because Rich was a chain smoker. And so, you know, I think those those three things, coupled with the fact that we were, you know, I'm pulling Rick into this equation, we were more or less outsiders. And he really liked that, you know. And, and of course, little did he know, Aaron was way outside and Mark Robertson was way outside. So, you know, he, he, he concocted a, a little mash that, that fit his needs. And on top of it, we were all pretty good musicians, you know? Yeah. yeah. 
pretty good. Pretty good. Well, uh, do you do you think, Jimmy? I, I kind of think, to some extent at least, he liked that we all did other things. He did, and he. I know it for sure, and I know with with Rick. I I know he was a this train fan. He helped me a lot. Yeah, and uh, and I I know he always had you do, you know, like the dream or something like that. Yeah, I mean, my first tour with them, I had to do a 40-minute set in the middle. So we would play Rich Mullins for 40 minutes, and then he'd say, here's this new guy, I want you to, you know, be nice and listen. (laughs) And I would do my cryptic weirdo thing, and then he would come back out and we would finish it off. And then that held true, you know, historically. I mean, Mark, he would have you do whatever you wanted he would always you know with me really did boil it down he you know, only, like right in the middle of the show yeah right. right in the middle i always felt like i was being eaten alive by doberman pincher evangelicals after his you know how can you follow rich mullins it, it was impossible this was my dream my wife and my kids were camped in a place where i could see 200 miles in every direction High on a grassy knoll, it was dark out. We had a fire burning bright on a warm summer night. But it did kind of, I remember those shows, and it he created something like a one-night festival. Theme. Yeah, in the round, kind of. And, it, yeah, and it, yeah. it was bigger than a Rich Mullins concert. He definitely liked me and my music a lot more than I did. In the rearview mirror, I recognize that now. <laughs> I, wish I, had, I wish I had listened to him more. Well, that's really interesting that you say that, because that's something I wanted to, to explore, is that in my interactions with Rich and in this conversation that I, go, I went back and listened to that I had with Rich, he, he says a lot of the same things that you're just talking about. The Mark, what you're talking about with feeling like he wasn't cool enough and uh, that kind of thing. But I was always impressed with how he seemed to be a a cultivator of community. Inclusion, big time. Inclusion that was not based on what was best for him and what was going to necessarily prop him up and make him look the coolest, but what was what was the aesthetic that he was going for? It seemed like there was a different kind of calculus he was using uh, that that was hard to pin down, but he created a different kind of energy. Mm-hmm. What, what do His, you guys he, say? You were there Well, every historically, night. Was he, he was for? very drawn to the band. There was a certain period of time there where this group of, of uh, musicians got together and made music together, and it became the band. You know, they recorded in a barn, they You're talking about the band. The band. Like Robbie Robertson. Yeah. And, right. So thank you for clarifying that. But but I know for a fact that was his aim. And even with Brothers Keeper, we we tried, at least I was a, a ancillary to his efforts, to not record in a studio, but instead to set up at, and, and we even found a couple of places to do it, but we couldn't get the higher-ups to sign off on it at the time it was really uh it was a two or three week window because rich was full-time at friends uh university trying to complete his degree and we had a very limited amount of time so the first few days were very uh flex and very much trying to assemble like going back to what i started with the band idea robbie robertson and all those guys and uh you know we had kind of missed since it was the middle of winter it made it difficult to go to amy's farm for example and set up a remote recording environment and everybody stay there and just you know have at it for a couple of weeks which is really what he wanted to do and so i you know in some ways i regret that we were never able to replicate that i mean the next the next go around i mean you can tell me if i'm wrong but i think the next go around with the was the jesus record and by design yeah. you know that that got that got morphed into a much more uh presidential uh presentation courtesy of word jim chafee and uh roland and and Ballman, they all saw a very big opportunity and a big record and there's no way we're going to go out to a cabin in the wilderness 
to make a, a dumb record for us. You know, I mean, I'd even floated Caribou because back at the time, Caribou was in service and it would have been the right band, you and me, Mark, you and me and Rick and Aaron. And it would have been a great experience, but he left the room early and the corporate wheels turning as they would pretty much exercised their option to not let us go have fun. Not that the Jesus re record wasn't fun. It was fun on, on some levels, but it was nothing like what we talked about pink. in the dream stage. Right. There was a lot of pressure on that record all the way around because, you know, Rich had just passed. That was a such a heavy thing for all of us because we he was very dear to all of us. It wasn't just our boss. You know, we were close. And then I think Rick felt a lot of pressure to make a great Rich Mullins record without Rich Mullins. So that was really tough. Now, I, I, I can tell you on Brothers Keeper, I, I remember I didn't get asked, and I was, I was uh, Jordan and I were starting to produce a lot of indie bands in Chicago. And um, on Brothers Keeper, I really kind of was bummed, but I happened to, I'm not just saying this for the tape. I've heard Jimmy play bass. I love the way he plays bass. So I, I would go like, well, they're, they're in good hands. But Rick called me at one point, like two or three days into the sessions. He's like, dude, I don't know what to tell you. Get in your car and get down here now. He said, like, like, and his take is he goes, Rich is running Jimmy ragged. He's having him try every instrument that's ever been invented just to see how it would work. I'm, t I'm telling you, just come here and hang out. And I'm like, I'm not going to do it that way. I'll have to, I didn't want to disrupt the flow. And there was kind of, there was more than a little tension back then between Phil and Rick that I didn't want to get in the middle of, which they very beautifully patched up. It took a very long time, but they patched it up. That's one of my most, um, the redemptive quotient regarding Rick patching things up with Phil stands, and everyone, me included. I mean, I never quite knew what Rick had on me. Uh, I know what I had on him, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, it, it, it's beautiful that, that there was a chance. And in fact, we had a good six or eight months, I believe, to really get back down to the river with Rick. I mean, I know this is not necessarily about Rick, but one of my favorite things that happened on the Brothers Keeper record that has nothing to do with music is Rick decided one day to get rid of his mullet. And uh, people may not remember, but Rick sported a pretty substantial uh, kind of Billy Ray Cyrus look. And uh, one day he showed up at the studio and Shelly had just cut his hair. And man, what a good looking dude Rick Elias is, right? And on that day, when he came back from his haircut, man, I'll never forget. I think that gave him an extra layer of, you know, affirmation personally somehow. All, all I know is that Rick was among the most handsome people I ever knew in my life for real. So it that had nothing to do with Brothers Keeper, but I, I think it helped him keep his voice in in the mix because I think Rich was pretty confused. He thought he wanted to produce, but he... He, he only in the rearview mirror would tell you that he doesn't know how to do it. And Rick, on the other hand, has uh, had exposed pretty great uh, features in that realm. I mean, Rick is a, I think Rick's a great producer. Now the plumber's got a drip in his spigots. The mechanic's got a blink in his car. And the preachers think I'm docile or wicked And the love has got a lonely heart And my friends ain't the way I wish they were They are just the way they are And I will be my brother's keeper Not the one who judges him I won't despise him for him Strength. I will take away his freedom I will help 
one of the things that seems to me, from my perspective of the time I had with Rich, that, boy, there was a, a level of joy and humor and fun the time we spent sitting around a table late at night at a restaurant or whatever and talking about things, it seemed to me that he saw things fundamentally or foundationally is probably a better word, different from other people I had met. And so as a young person, he became influential to me and in how I started to assemble my thoughts about navigating art and culture and relationships and how to engage the world as a person of faith. He was always learning and challenging himself and had, it seemed to me when you talk about assembling a band, am I wrong or overstating it to say that some of that is wanting to have people that are gonna push against you and challenge you and not just do what you tell them to do? Is part of, is part of the process for him of becoming a better artist, wanting a Rick Elias in his life or a Jimmy Abeg that's gonna say, Rich, you could do that better? And is there a parallel there to the spiritual formation that he was seeing of wanting to grow and actually have things challenged in his life? And is there, am I reading too much into that? Mark? I, I don't know for sure. You know, there was a time, one thing that Rick and Rich had in common is they both had really massive egos, yet they didn't really like that about themselves. But it didn't stop them occasionally, if you know what I'm saying. Like, Rich had a period where he wouldn't tell us anything. He just let us be us. I mean, Jimmy dressed like Jimmy. I dressed like a rockabilly dork, uh, you know. And he liked that eclectic thing. It looked like this this art house vibe of bringing in all these different different uh, points of view. And I think he fed off of that. But there would be times where he'd have a meltdown. I don't know if you remember this gig, Jimmy, but we we had hit a point. The rags were getting really, really good with Rich. Like we were starting to get really read each other and. And uh, I felt like I, I was really finding some cool stuff with Aaron that I that I enjoyed. But we were starting to get really loud and almost stonesy for a while, where we were getting a little looser. And Jimmy would take off on a tangent. We go like, "Yeah, let's go over there for a while." And and at one point, Rich kind of had a meltdown. Like we were getting so loud and kind of doing our own thing. Like he 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 got really mad at us one gig and made us all turn down where we couldn't even hear ourselves and just play it by the numbers. And then it slowly, it, then it went back, and he got mad at himself for, for doing it, you know. Both of those guys also had this in common. When they would catch themselves being an egomaniac, they would go on this days-long tirades of the self-deprecating thing against themselves because of how freeing it was to just go, like, I was just being an idiot, you know. They, they Very extreme in those senses, you know. So Rich had an ego, you know, he loved it when other people played his songs, for example, you know, and things like that. He wasn't afraid to be the boss. He wasn't afraid to remind us that he was the boss occasionally, but it was pretty occasional. I, I think he, by the Jesus record, when I was making records with Rich at my, my teeny little studio in Elgin, Illinois, you know, we made Canical of the Plains of Mitch's first record, and we were weeks away from starting the Jesus record, like a couple weeks away. I th at that point, I think he was really comfortable with all of us and what our strengths and weaknesses were and how he could best utilize that, which is sort of the weird tragedy. I mean, I, I wish that thing had gone on at least, say, maybe five years longer to really see what we could have done in that in that way. But it kind of afforded us something Rich was trying to do for us in the first place. You know, he was trying to encourage us to be artists in our own right. Because the more we play with Rich, the more we go like, nobody wants to hear me, man. You just do it. You know, and it's like, I I'll just play bass for you. I like this, you know, and you're communicating this better. But he sort of forced us into doing what he thought we should have been doing in the first place, which was to be more ourselves and bring it out our personalities. So once the, the Jesus record was done, I felt like the band could be whatever it wanted. And that, that, was, that was great until it wasn't, you know. We had about an eight, 18 month thing that I, I went like, we're the best band in the world, you know. Oh, you did not have a home. There were places you visited frequently. You took off your shoes and scratched your feet because you knew that the whole world belonged to the meek, but you did not have a home. No, you did not.
not have a home And you did not take a wife There were pretty maids all in a row Who lined up to touch the hem of your robe But you had no place to take them So you did not take a wife No, you did not take a wife Birds have nests Foxes have dens But the hope of the whole world rests On the shoulders of a homeless man You have the shoulders of a homeless man No, you did not have a home Well, you had no stones to throw You came without an axe to grind Did not tow the party line No one to sight came to the blind Had no stones to throw the funniest thing about your question, John, is you immediately reminded me the first tour I did with them when I was just, I played uh, mandolin and guitar and bass. That tour in particular, I had just come from about six or eight years with Peacock and Vector and some 77 stuff. And so my, my sensibilities about what makes something good were very different than Rich's. I had, you know, you kind of get down to the brass tacks of rehearsing and where things go and how loud it should be and how, where things should be. And I found myself in this band where I was by far the most mature musician of the crowd. And he came to me on more than one occasion and asked me to dumb it down a little because I was making everybody look bad, apparently. Like, I have no idea what he's talking about. But that culminated about halfway through the tour. We were actually at the Rosemont Horizon, and uh, we had flown in from, our last gig was in Reno, and that day we had to get on a plane, fly to Chicago, uh, do a sound check. We were, we were there for two nights, thankfully. But that first night was under duress because we played the night before, got up at about four in the morning, got on enough airplanes to get to Chicago in time to do a sound check and perform at this huge event where his whole family had come, his mom, his brothers and sisters, my wife and my kids had driven up from Nashville uh, and... It was just this weird scenario, right? And I'll never forget that night in between sets, he comes backstage and he grabs me and walks me down the hall and proceeds to just tear me a new a-hole over something that I had nothing to do with. He was mad because somebody inadvertently left his keyboard unplugged. He proceeds to to ball me out over something I had nothing to do with. And he had already been a little mad at me because everybody in the band really liked me, especially Beaker. We really hit it off and became great friends. And Rich was very territorial about all of that. He was so pissed off at me and I let him go. And when I realized that I'm the wrong George for his bitching out, at the end I said, dude, my wife's here tonight with my kids i'm be, i'm so happy for this to be the last night i play with you you just say the word and i'm if you don't like what i'm doing i'll go home tomorrow and if not then i can go the next day i'll just get i'm a bus ticket away from getting out of here so just so you know i don't appreciate your uh intensity uh and your wrongful assassination of something that I, I had nothing to do with. So you think, Jimmy, I think if you were going to become close with Rich, you had to go through that that particular hoop. I went through it with him in a different way. You kind of had to do, like, he and I weren't close at first. when we I, The first tour I did, like, he treated me not that good. And we had to have a real kind of serious thing, and it was great after. You know, it's like, I don't know what that was, but I, th- I know that Rich took friendships really seriously, but you had to do an unreasonable amount of hazing to get there. 
You had to go through an unreasonable, or I did. I, I certainly did. No, I did too. It was it was embarrassing, and and in fact, that incident I just described was really the the last straw for me because this had been ha- we started in you know eastern United States and the South and Florida and all through Texas and Arizona, you know, whatever ended up getting us to Reno and then on into the Midwest for the last bit of that tour, man, it had been piling up. I mean, he had been on my case repeatedly for every un, every unbelievable nothing you can imagine. And I had just finally said, you know what, Q, you go do what you want. I'm going to go back to my life. I'll see you later. So in a, in a way, I, I kind of had to somehow put him in his place regarding me. And man, the very next day, all apologies. I mean, it's as if through that very thing, which you just described earlier, I might have been the first person that pushed back on him in a while, for all I know. I do know that from that next day, man, friend for life. I mean, he, he, you know, he even offered to pay me more. And, you know, I mean, it was really a, an incident of note in my personal history. And I think it's because I told him to shut up. He was wrong. He was wrong. Well, I am a good Midwestern boy. Giving honest day's work if I can get it. I don't cheat on my taxes. I don't cheat on my girl. I got values that would make the White House jealous. When I do get a little much over impressed, till I think of Peter and Paul and the apostles. I don't stack up too well against them, I guess. By the standards round here, I ain't doing that often. Lord, it's hard to turn the other cheek. Hard to bless when others curse you. Oh Lord, it's hard to be a man of peace, Lord, it's hard. Oh, it's hard, you know it's hard to be like Jesus, don't you know it's hard? Oh, it's hard, oh Lord, it's hard to be like Jesus. It seems to me that Rich, in assembling an actual band of brothers, was trying to create community where people could tell him, could push against him instead of just being other people saying yes all the time to him. Uh, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that it, it's always easy. Like when someone's going to come up and say, man, I think you're off base on that or whatever. That doesn't mean you're, it's not going to rub you the wrong way. If you're going to get anywhere, if you're going to grow, if you're going to recognize any progress in life, you've got to be teachable and you're not going to be teachable if you think you're right <laughs> about everything. And, and you got to put people around you that are willing to, to uh, push on you. It seems like Rich was doing that at that point. He seemed to kind of have a, a desire to push the envelope a little bit. Uh, do you sense that? Maybe Aaron. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. He, he definitely pushed the envelope. I mean, like every day, just the way he lived. Musically, I'm not sure. You know, I often think... I often wonder what the Jesus record would have sounded like had he been living to do it. You know, whether whether he would, whether it would have sounded like um, like a normal rich record if if he didn't get a producer. You know, the way we recorded uh, Brothers Keeper. Would we have done it that same way, you know? And if so, how how would it have sounded? I don't personally think so, because, I mean, he had told me that Rick was definitely going to produce. I think it would have been more raw, because Rich's plan in my mind, and, I, you know, I was in the studio with him doing Mitch's record right before he passed. He said he wanted to make a Rags record where the Rags could really shine. And then as soon as that record was done, we would tour that, but he was going to make a record without us uh and it would be m- much more of a praise and worship type record but yeah I, I get your point Aaron but we'll never really know when he came and was telling me about the Jesus record songs it was funny he he came over to True Tunes one afternoon he was working on something at Wheaton and had some downtime and he's like man 
I got these songs and I'm so excited about this whole record's going to be all about Jesus. And I looked at him like, uh, how, how is that different than all of your record? <laughs> like, I didn't understand it. And he was so excited, but I could not understand what exactly he was talking about. But then that led us into a conversation about that I still don't feel I, I wish I had recorded it because it was just us hanging out. But he was getting back to this idea that we as disciples or as the church, as believers, whatever, needed to think more about the, the foundational person of Jesus and the message of Jesus. And that if we could do that as a, as a community, it might correct some of the nonsensical behavior downstream from some of those misunderstandings. And that was interesting because because it flowed out of some of the conversations we had been having about fundamentalism and and this is now 25 years ago. So um, when you guys were hearing about the songs and hearing him talk about that record and where he was going with that, I guess that's part of what I'm getting at is he had seemed to have had an idea about impacting his audience with these songs that might at one level just seem like more Rich Mullins songs, but there was something else going on with him where he had an intention about that thing that was deeper. Do you guys have a sense of what that was? I kind of don't, although I totally get what you're saying. Like, in my mind, I just went like, these are great songs. And when he asked us all to co-write on that record, you know, I came up with that one tune and Beaker helped me finish it. And uh, and that I tried to go under his guidelines, which is like trying to just, it's not how to fit Jesus into contemporary society or how to, it was just like what he said, what he did, remove yourself from the equation as much as you can and just focus on on Christ that way. But it, it's still, that's a pretty subtle distinction from anything else he ever did. So in that sense, I agree with you. I agree with you, John, in that I don't know is, is like, I think Hard to Get might be the best song he ever wrote, but I'm not an awesome God guy. You know, it's like the, like, I didn't, I, I don't understand the praise and worship thing very well. And uh, it, it, it always sounds a little forced to me, whereas like something like Hold Me Jesus, Awesome God, I'm sorry, uh, Hard to Get or uh, The Color Green, or calling out your name. Those are ones where I go like, okay, so that's the kind of great poetry he was capable of. I know, I know that might have been the most interesting aspect had we made the record with him. Maybe we would have caught a little bit more of what he was getting at. Hear the prayers of those of us who live on earth Who are afraid of being left by those we love And who get hardened in the earth Do you remember when you lived down here But we all scream To find the faith to ask for daily bread did you forget about us? Do you have thrown away? Well, I memorized every word you said. Still, I'm so scared I'm holding my breath. While you're up there just playing hard to get. When I met Rich, I, I was playing for Rick Elias and he opened for Rich. He goes, you're going to love this guy. He's cool. And we were hanging out backstage and I loved him. I loved Beaker. We had met before Jimmy, but not really. I don't think we knew each other that well. You may not remember, but Mike Radofsky was in your trio that yeah, you guys opened for us in Dallas. That was that tour. Exactly. And I'll never forget meeting Rick. I had met Rick in, in Paul Emery's office, you know, our, our, he managed both of us for a minute. 
and I'll, I'll never forget how much I liked him. And then unbeknownst to me, there you guys were. And I met you because you might have been rooming with Mike. Oh, I was, yeah. Little did any of us know that we would all be together soon. <laughs> yeah. When I watched Rick and you and Mike, you know, I was done with the cycle that was my Entertaining Angels solo record, which is what probably got me on that tour in the first place. And uh, we were talking about doing a, a second one, and I wanted to do things a little bit differently. And anyway, I ended up sitting with Bill Hearn and Peter York at the Reunion Arena watching you guys play and remembering having this conversation that we needed for me to work in the marketplace that they were trying to uh, break into, we needed Rick Elias. But I remember specifically sitting there and pretty much leaving that conversation knowing that I had had a part to play in getting Rick signed to the label that I was on. As far as I could tell, I had succeeded in selling them the idea that if I'm going to work as a fringe artist on Sparrow, which is a hopelessly down the middle CCM thing that I needed to have. We needed more artists like me. And Rick was the perfect, man, Rick was so great. Come on, pretty baby. What would you say, um, Aaron, if, if you had been out on the road and you discovered some artists, what are some of the characteristics that would define a singer-songwriter or a band that would put them in the category of an artist like Rich Mullins? Well, I think the thing that made Rich special because was mainly because he was the only guy doing what he did during that time. I think he spoke to a large audience and he even pulled some people over to his thing. I think people were looking for that and very open to his approach and his simplicity and you know it wasn't a big deal whereas uh, other CCM artists may have, you know, been more glam and and followed all the uh, trappings of being a uh, uh, rock star or something. You know, that makes sense. Yeah. And it got even worse. You know, they, they started having, you know, what was that GMA conference? You know, they started just trying to put parameters on what CCM even sat, what the sound is, you know, and now it's, it's like, you know, for years, at least it was like Coldplay trying to sound like you too. And it is a very, very specific template that you had to write within. And Thankfully for us, none of the guys Rich had in his band even knew what that was. And if Rich did know what that was, he had no interest in it. So that's where we luck well, we lucked out that there was somebody that was sympathetic to the fact that we didn't want to know about that. Right. Well, and he knew what paid the bills. Of course he was under pressure to, to fit in, you know, but he rebelled against that stuff, and it was, and that was great. I thought that was fantastic. I think he finally reached a level of financial uh, independence that he, uh, just like, you know, starting with Brothers Keeper, he had earned the position to say, you know what, I'm going to produce this, you know, and that takes time in the way the old system worked. These days, I'm, I'm happy to pronounce the fact that anybody can sit down with their laptop and make a record if they want to. That was not the case back then. Over and over, again and one more time. 
As I mentioned, Aaron was having some computer problems and didn't join the main conversation until it was almost over, so I got him a bit later that night and asked him a few questions about Rich as well. How did playing with Rich compare to what you expected playing with Rich to be like? Well, what I expected it to be like was I was going to have to come into this thing and uh, conform to a certain degree and um, start thinking like a, a pop drummer. The first day of rehearsal, we're like in the middle of nowhere in Indiana. There's a church, but only you can see it from the, from the air. It's surrounded, the air. It's surrounded by corn. <laughs> so me and Mark were the new guys. We were the newbies. Rick hired or suggested Mark and Jimmy suggested me. So we get up to this thing in Indi this place and it was a church in Indiana and we start rehearsal. And only me, Rick, I mean me, Rich and Mark know what's going on. It's like Jimmy and Rick are just like don't know the songs. <laughs> and so, wow. And so it's like Mark and I had been practicing so hard because I, I guess Mark kind of had the same feeling that I had, you know, want to get up there and, and be prepared because it was our first gig together at, at Cornerstone as this band and the tour that followed. So we, you know, Rich would call a song and we play it. Me and Mark would play it. <laughs> <laughs> so like we spent we would spend like hours you know so that the guitarists could learn their parts and stuff and you know was, so at that point i realized that i it was good to be prepared now that i know this i can embellish it and kind of be myself in it in that way it was like wow, this is cool, you know, and, and then getting to know Rich and how free-spirited he was, it was like, yeah. What was it like on a friend level with you and Rich? Rich taught me pretty much not to be a, a legalist hmm. because when I first saw a photograph of Rich, it was on some record of his and he, you know, he had on this blue and red, really nice jacket, and it was about a campfire, you know, and it was a glam shot, you know? And so that's who I thought I was going to play with. <laughs> and then when he shows up at the church in Indiana, and he's like, he do doesn't have any knees in his pants, and, you know, I think he has on some sandals of some sort and old dingy shirt and unshaven you know it's like he looks like he just got out of bed you know i was like oh okay and then, and then i would hear him speak you know on stage during the shows and it was like this guy's legit man you know so that's that's what i got from him that i i didn't have that i didn't have to be a legalist and that all i had to do was be a christian love christ that sort of thing, and it didn't matter what I wore, what I looked like, none of that, you know. And um, I, I, I hadn't come to a point where I could meld my past with what was going on. It was like almost I had to abandon a lot of the things I thought and felt in, in the past, and I've found out that I didn't, you know. It was my life. And Rich was a part of helping Just you kind of realize that? Yeah, yeah, it was my life. And when I repented, I repented of things that I had done and I should move on, you know. But um, that wasn't the way it was at first. But I think every every believer at first kind of kind of goes through that kind of tremor sort of period, you know, until they get it right. You know, un un until you're around other mature believers and that sort of thing and as you get older and mature in your faith you know it kind of 
levels out. But at first, man, it's like scary. When you think about the kind of way that he modeled in his life, what are some attributes of that that you've tried to apply in your continuing spiritual formation over the last 20 years? How has that had a lingering influence on you? You know, the Christian community around us now is everything he said it was back yeah. then. <laughs> you know, and he was, it was kind of like he was warning us, you know, that uh, telling us in a certain way that all this was going to go down. Um, you know, I'm not, or I, I try really hard not to be judgmental. Um, I'm very cautious about uh, church and church people right now. And um, like I said, I think he was he was warning us that it was that this was coming, and it was like, well, you know, maybe on the fringe, but you really didn't want to believe that it was like going to happen, like. To the yeah, church, yeah. you know what I mean. Um, other insights I have gotten from like uh, pastor friends and attending certain churches, you know, it's like um, all that has come together for me to put me in a place like to where I can, I can like really relax and still know that my faith is intact. So it's rich as wisdom, and I have been fortunate enough to be around other wise believers. But Rich started it. Rich started me thinking about it, you know, because I, I became a believer with the 77s and at Warehouse Ministries, and all that was good. I mean, all that was good. But the next level was being with Rich. It was a link there because I came from Warehouse Ministries, which is like, a, you know, it's not a big church, a big, con you know, big um, um, uh, denominational sort of thing. So I was kind of fit in, in my thinking and what I thought about the gospel to go with Rich. And my spirit was fit to go, to, to go right. into that right. situation because of where I had come from. But then when I heard him speak, I had never heard anybody speak like that. I want to thank Aaron, Jimmy, and Mark for taking this time to reflect back on Rich and his impact. I wish we had gotten to do this in time to get some words from our brother Rick Elias. His presence is definitely felt here, and you'll hear Rich talk about Rick in some pretty hilarious ways on the next episode. As we wrap up this first part of our two-part Rich Mullins special, I wanted to take a couple of minutes to share a little bit about my relationship with Rich. Way back in 1986, I was a sophomore in high school, and as a part of my radio and TV class, I got an internship at a local Christian radio station, WCRM. One of the things I got to do there was to cart singles, which basically meant I recorded 7-inch records to special tape cartridges for broadcast use. I had to clean the records, check the speed of the turntable, get everything just right, and then record it to the tape. It was grunt work, I guess, but I loved it. One day, I was back there in the production studio when this guy walked in and asked what I was doing. I told him, showed him the tapes, and he was super interested in it all. I had no idea who he was. In fact, I thought he might have just wandered in from the parking lot. But it was cool to know something that someone else didn't know, and he seemed really nice. He sat in there with me for a while, and after a bit, the program director came in and said, Hey, are you Rich Mullins? He said, Yep. You're supposed to be in the studio. Rich said, I thought I was in the studio. I've just been hanging out with John here waiting for someone to tell me what to do. Well, he had wandered into the wrong studio and blown some of his interview time hanging out with the intern. Rich had just released his first album and I had no idea who he was, but I listened to the interview and learned that he had written an Amy Grant song that they played on that station a lot. I found a copy of his record and I listened to it as I did my work. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't really my kind of stuff. But man, I really liked him. 
At that same time, I had just started my first job as the music buyer at a Catholic Christian bookstore, and I loved every minute of it. I was learning a ton about managing a business, taking care of customers, and selling music, and every time Rich Mullins came through town, he remembered to invite little old me to his shows and to various industry receptions and whatnot long before I had a reason to be there. He treated this scraggly, long-haired rock and roll kid with honor and completely unearned respect. I eventually found out that, as special as Rich made me feel, I was definitely not unique. He had this way about him of collecting people and forming tribes wherever he went. Although he was quickly becoming one of the biggest names in Christian music, he actively disassembled whatever pedestal people put him on, while simultaneously working to harness the material rewards produced by his music for the benefit of others. He was quietly giving away almost all of his money, living simply, almost like some new kind of monk who brought his monastery with him wherever he went. And here's the thing I have just been coming to realize over the last several years. As confident as I came off to the public in those early True Tunes days, I was a deeply insecure young man, still haunted by some pretty profound childhood trauma and confused by clashing instincts between the urge to retreat from culture or to engage it and between the call to holiness and the temptation to self-righteousness, among other things. While I was looking for answers, Rich seemed to be searching for a path. He was looking for a way to navigate the Christian music industry and maintain community despite his own nomadic lifestyle. There was something about him that told me I could trust him to help me find my path too. I realize now that he, like a few other significant people in my life, was filling a big brother role that I needed. I think you'll hear that in our conversation in the next episode of the True Tunes Podcast. That's going to do it for today. Part two with Rich Mullins is coming soon. While you wait, if you have not heard our episodes with Phil Madura, I encourage you to go check them out as well as the other episodes in the archives. A big thanks to my partner, Bruce A. Brown, working so hard over there in the production and editing suite several hundred miles down the hall to my right. And thanks so much to all of my guests that made this episode possible. Do check out the show notes page for lots more information. Also, I have assembled a special Spotify playlist of songs that seem to, in one way or another, carry some aspect of the ghost of Rich Mullins. It's got tracks by Peterson, as well as Johnny Swim with Drew Holcomb, Jason Gray, the Ragamuffin Band, Mitch McVicker, Matt Marr, Andrew Osenga, Amy Grant, Todd Agnew, Rick Elias, Waterdeep, Jarza Clay, and even the lo-fi indie legends, the Mountain Goats, who have cited Rich as a favorite. You can find this mix on the show notes page, and if you can think of an artist that should be added or a song that I missed, please tweet at me, at John. J. Thompson, and I'll take your suggestion under advisement. We'll leave this mix up indefinitely alongside our other long-term mixes curated by Buddy Miller and Phil Madeira so it can grow over time. And while you're waiting for part two, for a stirring and in-depth look at the last few months of Rich's life and work, look up a homespun documentary by our friend Andrew Montanera called The Work You Began, The Last Days of Rich Mullins on YouTube. It's quite good. And if you would like to help us in our mission to help people listen to better music and listen to music better, you can join our Patreon program for as little as $5 a month. The details are on the show notes page or over at patreon.com slash true tunes. So check that out if you are so inspired and thank you very much. The contents of the podcast are protected by U.S. copyright law and are the intellectual property of Gyroscope Productions, with the exception of songs or clips that are from previously copywritten materials. Everything on this episode is used by permission or under fair use provisions. This program is intended for the private use of our listening audience. Gyroscope Productions can be reached at jjt at truetunes.com or P.O. Box 60401, Nashville, Tennessee, 37206. Until next time, this is JJT inviting you to listen carefully for the sound of hope, because it is easily drowned out by the noise of the day, but it is that sound that gives us the strength to carry on. And sorry about this, Bruce Brown. You're going to have to edit this. But I just said, there's that man with the stopwatch waving his arm. So I guess that means we've got to clear out. So we sure hope you like our music and that you'll tune in next time we come your way. So long, everyone.